This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond and a very special welcome to the 41st Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Justin Fairfax. David, thank, thank, you. thank you so much. For thank being you. Here. I'm really honored to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Really do appreciate it. And looking on uh, at, at your universities, Duke and Columbia, <laughs> it's nice to see that they are prominent and, yes. and appreciative of the fact that one of their graduates is is now in leadership here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Absolutely. And on one of them, I found this quote: <laughs> that "Virginia proved that we can be a bright light in political darkness." Yes. Absolutely. And Absolutely. That, that's, I think, is kind of the message that you've brought to the office. Yes. And it's, it's good to see you up there presiding and being Thank in you. charge in the Senate. Thank you. Well, I really have enjoyed it uh, immensely. Uh, we're now in week number three, and uh, I should give, uh, first of all, kudos to the Senate staff, and in particular, Senate Clerk Susan Shaw. She is fantastic. Her team is really world class, and so they have helped me uh, to get acclimated uh, to presiding over the Senate, and the senators uh, on both sides of the aisle have been incredibly gracious and, and welcoming, and uh, so I think we've had a really good uh, first several weeks, and looking forward to a great session, and uh, you mentioned Duke University and, and Columbia Law School. Uh, they are two great institutions and places that I owe uh, a great deal to. Uh, they help prepare me. Uh, they have been supportive of me uh, throughout the years, and uh, I'm very grateful to have you know, been able to have those experiences there. Now, I mentioned that you were number 41, but, you're, <laughs> but you haven't even reached 41 years of age yet. And, and, That's right. And I think That's right. certainly uh, perhaps the youngest ever lieutenant governor in the Commonwealth, as far as we can tell? You know, I'm one of the youngest, and uh, I'm, I'm now 38 years old. Uh, you're too kind to ask, but I, <laughs> and I will turn 39 next month in February. But uh, w one who I know was younger uh, was uh, 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 sort of uh, Sh Sergeant uh, Reynolds, I'm sorry, oh, yes. uh, who was okay. actually about 33 to 34 years old when he was elected uh, to be lieutenant governor. So uh, as far as I can tell, at least in modern Virginia history, right. he was, uh, he's the youngest that I could find. And uh, Don Byer and Chuck Robb were both about my exact same age. So when they were elected, they were either 38 or 39. So uh, sort of in that club uh, right there. But I know that Sergeant Reynolds was uh, a little bit younger than, than, than all of us. Yeah, some of us were talking about the, the younger ones. And we said, well, we've only had lieutenant governors since the 1850s. Right. And, and back at that time, people often didn't live to be more than 60 or so. So right. there were probably some young governors and lieutenant governors <laughs> back, back in that time. No, that's right. I've got to tell you that I've heard any number of people say that your calm voice and your infectious laughter <laughs> goes a long way to creating a good atmosphere in the Senate and helping to put people at ease when you're presiding as, yeah. as well as when we're having a conversation. <laughs> well, thank you. And, uh, and again, people have been so warm and, and welcoming. We have had some very funny moments uh, even right. our first several weeks of uh, you're getting legislation passed but also on the floor uh, some impromptu things that have come up and uh, I'm always mindful I'm mic'd up when I'm up there on the dais and so I, I do really enjoy a good laugh and, and I love to keep a spirit 
of cooperation and people sort of working together there will certainly be things on which the parties disagree and i've always subscribe to the notion that you can disagree without being disagreeable and i think a level of respect and decorum goes a really long way and and that's really how i was raised i think it really is the hallmark of virginia too it's really in many ways what virginia has come to be known for and so i want to add to that climate of civility and collegiality and and i hope that marks my time there presiding over the senate and as your predecessors have said and as have the experience, they don't vote that often, but whenever they vote, they vote on the winning side. <laughs> Ralph said that was the best part of the job. Yes. <laughs> that's right. So every time he votes, he wins. That's <laughs> right. That's right. So we have, we've not yet had a, had a tie, but we've had some close ones. Uh, but I do look forward to, uh, in those instances, breaking ties and, uh, and certainly in keeping with uh, a lot of the platform issues that we talked about, expanding opportunity and uh, health care access and uh, college affordability, all those things. Uh, should they come up for a tie, right. uh, certainly would break those in favor uh, of those policies. Well, 2013, you made a run for statewide office and came very, very close yes. to, to getting the nomination. Yeah. Um, I could ask you why you ran in 13, but I'd be more interested. <laughs> Some people, if they run once, well, that was it. Right. But what really inspired you to to run again? And yeah. Well, you know, I, and I think the, the answers would, would be very similar as to why I ran in 13 uh, and then again in 17. And it's really uh, animated by my passion for public service and in particular uh, providing other people the same shot in life that I've been blessed to have. David, you've been so kind and you know a lot about my story. Uh, but, right. you know, I was uh, you know, raised primarily by my mom. I you know, two great parents, but they got divorced when I was young. And uh, so then my mom had to move her four kids in with my uh, late maternal grandparents, two really incredible people. Uh, grandfather, World War II veteran, uh, Howard graduate, wow. worked yes. in the Postal Service for 45 years. Grandmother, Howard graduate, worked as a nurse for 40 years. Uh, they took us into their home and that really turned our story around. And so uh, mom was able to buy the house across the street, uh, then send all four of her children to college and two of us to law school. Uh, really was this incredible journey uh, that we got to take. And uh, I've always been mindful of what people did to make that story possible. And what I vowed at a very early age was that uh, if I had the opportunity, I would make sure that I went out and fought and make sure more people had that exact same shot no matter where they started or what bumps in the road they encountered in life. And so uh, that's why I ran in 13. I left my job as a federal prosecutor and got on the road. And a lot of people said, Justin Fairfax, who? Uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> when we got out right, there, but right. got to meet a lot of folks. We had a very close, as you mentioned, primary with our good friend Mark Herring, uh, who won and has done a great job as attorney general. And, uh, and then four years later, when the opportunity presented itself, uh, threw our hat in the ring for a lieutenant governor. We're fortunate uh, to have won that primary. It was a three-way primary by about 10 percentage points. And uh, later to win the general by a little less than six percentage points. And so uh, it's really been a great journey. And uh, inauguration uh, a couple few weeks back uh, was really special, I think, for everyone uh, involved. And I'm just so grateful for the opportunity. And that inauguration is bound to be, I mean, there was a fantastic story that came out yes. later about what you experienced on that day, on yes. that Martin Luther King weekend, I yes, would call it, absolutely. but something very special in your family. And if you don't mind telling sure. telling our viewers, because they maybe haven't read it, but it's <laughs> a great, great story of what happened. Well, thank you. And you're very kind to bring it up. And it was a, a piece that had uh, run in the Washington Post, and Greg Snyder at the Post did a really wonderful job with our story. Right. And I'm uh, very grateful to him. And, and essentially what, what, what happened was uh, there were some family documents that were discovered the week uh, leading up to uh, our inauguration on January the 13th. Uh, one in particular was a manumission document uh, for my several greats ago grandfather, Simon Fairfax, uh, that was signed in 1798. Wow. Uh, so this was yes. the ninth Lord Fairfax uh, who had freed, uh, in this case, a couple uh, of his slaves, one of whom was my several greats ago grandfather. Uh, and when the document was discovered, it made its way to my father, uh, who was uh, there with us at inauguration. He handed that document to me about 20 minutes before I went out uh, of the doors of the portico uh, to take the oath of office. Uh, and at first, I didn't know what it was. And so he handed it to me, and I tried to hand it back because I just didn't want to lose it in the hustle and right, bustle of what right. was going on. And he said, no, son, you really need to have this. Uh, you don't have it on you. So I had it in my breast pocket uh, as I raised my right hand and took the oath of office as the 41st lieutenant governor uh, of Virginia. And so it really was special. And what I said, it was you know, obviously special for my family, but I think it was a much larger story than that. I think it was special for Virginia. I think it was Virginia's story. Um, I also think it's America's story. And it's, it's really the story of us making progress over time, 
uh, as Dr. King said, and as you mentioned, it was his weekend, and I began presiding over the Senate on MLK Day right. on January 15th for the very first time. Uh, Dr. King said the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And, and that really reminded you know, me uh, of that journey that we frankly all have taken and that if we you know, keep you know, our eyes in the future, if we treat each other uh, as equals and uh, find opportunities, that, uh, ways to expand opportunity for more people, uh, we can have every family you know, take that kind of journey right. in life. And so it was a powerful moment uh, and something that I will always uh, remember and cherish and something I hope inspires. Uh, people, no matter where they come from, uh, in Virginia and around the country, uh, that we can always rise to the better angels of our nature. And, and if our viewers want to really dig in and see more of what what was written in that Washington Post article, they can find it easily online. It, they can it, it is, absolutely, it is, it is, and it including there. a copy of the document, which is written in cursive. <laughs> it's really a beautiful uh, old uh, old school cursive, and so uh, it really has a lot of detail in it. Uh, and, and it is a powerful document, something that I you know, keep with me oh. most of the time as well. I think it's, I think it's phenomenal that it was found at the time it was found, too. Yes, yes. And I, you know, like I said, I do not believe in coincidences. I mean, there, there are so many things that have happened right. that I just you can't explain uh, by sort of right. normal logic and coincidence. And uh, we actually discovered a, a, a grave, a, a plot, uh, where my several grades ago grandmother is actually buried in mm. Reston, Virginia. Uh, and this was during the course of the campaign. There were a number of people who uh, had mm. come together, didn't know each other beforehand, found this, brought it to my attention, and I happened to visit uh, that grave site uh, on the 112th anniversary to the day of uh, when she was buried or uh, when she died. And so uh, we hadn't planned it that way at all. It just so happened to be the day I was visiting. Uh, and she died in 1905 on January the 18th, and I happened to go there on January the 18th. So things like that were occurring oh, all throughout yes. the course of the camp. And I just said, you know, this can't be explained by coincidence. Right. And, and I think something else is, is something else powerful is happening. And I just wanted to share that story with everyone. Yes. Well, lieutenant governor officers have been probably everywhere since the 1850s. <laughs> uh, I right. can remember back to Chuck Robb up in the in the bell tower. Yes, I heard about that. Right? <laughs> it, it's got to be meaningful to you that you're in the Oliver Hill building. It is. It is. And I appreciate you noting yeah. that. It, it's, it's a powerful thing. And every day that I uh, go into that office, obviously the great portrait uh, of a great man, Oliver Hill. And uh, I'm also reminded of the fact that, you know, I would not have the opportunity really to serve as uh, lieutenant governor or mm -hmm. to have other opportunities in life were it not for uh, legal giants um, and civil rights leaders like Oliver Hill, who you know, stood up at a time that was very difficult to do so, who broke down uh, institutional barriers, who demanded, uh, you know, that we right. uh, comply with the mandates of our Constitution uh, and, you know, and make sure that everyone uh, is afforded equal opportunity uh, in this country. And, uh, and so I really stand on the shoulders of giants, um, including Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson and Thurgood Marshall, and right here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, our very own L. Douglas Wilder, who uh, is a dear friend and a political hero of mine. And uh, he, of course, was there on Inauguration Day, yes. so that was incredibly yes. special. Uh, to, to have that opportunity, and he's given me great advice over the years, and uh, and just great encouragement, uh, and, and he's inspired me for a long time. Of the, those of my generation who've been around Capitol Square a great deal, it's, yes, it's great to see names of buildings: Oliver Hill, yes. Barbara Johns. It's, yes, it's good to see the Barbara Johns statue Absolutely. that's there and everything, that's right. and the women's monument Absolutely. coming mantle. I mean, the yeah. with all the discussion that that takes place within the Commonwealth, in different localities and around the nation about different statues that are around. It, it's, <laughs> right. it's good to see the, the changes that have come to Capitol Square. Absolutely. Uh, all within the last 20 years or so. Yeah, that no, that's, that's exactly right. And, and I think what it does is it adds to the richness of our story. Yes. Uh, when everyone's story is told, uh, I think we're better off for it. Uh, and, you know, there are voices, of course, that historically have not been, uh, you know, uh, included. And, and we're now seeing that change. And I think that's a wonderful uh, and powerful thing because we're locking not only the, the past and the histories uh, of these you know, great people and great communities, but I think unlocking the brilliance of what they have to offer for the right. future. Uh, so for every young you know, girl and, and woman who visits uh, after the great women's monument uh, is built yes. and, and gets to see that and is inspired by that uh, and goes on to do great things, we've unlocked you know, another brilliant uh, story uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Same with uh, you know, Barbara Johns and, uh, and Oliver Hill and, and so many others. I, I visited the Moton Museum uh, during the course of the yes, campaign, and, yes. and I know, I'm sure you've powerful. been there. It is a powerful yeah. thing, and the way they preserve it is just really incredible. The way they tell the story is incredible. Uh, but to have gone there and to come back uh, and to see the Barbara Johns statue, it really uh, animates it and brings it to life. And you think about a 16-year-old 
regardless of gender or race doing something as courageous as she did in the time that she did it it allows you to find something in yourself to say you know no excuses we've got to stand up with courage and we've got to fight for other people. I think in our history there have been leaders like that there have been movements that are taking place and and we may be in another movement with the Me Too movement and all the movement that's taking place. Sure. But let me go to some of the uh, we, we know why you ran. You're here. Yes. It's really a part-time job. That, that, that you, <laughs> so they that tell you me play. now. That. <laughs> yeah. and, and it doesn't seem that way. Maybe until sometime in May or June that it might right. seem a bit more part-time. But what <laughs> what what do you envision working on, or some of the some of the passions that you have sure. outside of uh, being the presiding officer in the, in the Senate? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, some of it dovetails with the legislative priorities that we have set out, of course, you know, expanding health care access, in this case, Medicaid expansion, something very, uh, very focused on. And we can do that legislatively, but uh, other opportunities as well. Dismantling piece by piece the school to prison pipeline is something that uh, many people are now right. starting to work on and I care deeply about. Um, criminal justice reform uh, more generally, but also getting people into higher paying jobs, giving them economic mobility. I have visited community colleges and apprenticeship programs and workforce training centers, centers and I really want to spend a lot of time uh, doing those sorts of things because if we can connect people up uh, with that kind of upward mobility, with those skills, that educational uh, opportunity, uh, we really can change the trajectory for themselves uh, and for their families and our com and communities. So uh, it's, it's, it's again going back to what animated me from the start. Uh, you know, people gave us a chance to rise and I want to make sure everybody has that exact same chance no matter where they live in the Commonwealth of Virginia, color, skin, gender, what God they pray to, uh, who they love. Uh, they should get a shot at the American dream and it's my passion to make sure I do everything I can uh, to help make that possible. Say a little bit more about that school to prison pipeline yeah. because we hear that a great deal around Capitol Square. People yes. are probably hearing it around the Commonwealth. Absolutely. What what, what does it mean, yeah. and what will changing that mean? Yeah, no, it's a great question, and and you know there are a few different components to it, but uh, one of the statistics that has stood out over time is that uh, Virginia is number one in referring young people uh, to the criminal justice system for school-based infractions. Uh, so we lead the nation. Uh, and we do so at a rate that is much higher uh, than most other states. And so uh, what, what I've said is that I don't believe our children are worse behaved than children in 49 other states in the District of Columbia. Uh, I do believe that our policies historically, and it really be a part of our culture uh, around criminal justice, particularly with, with juveniles, um, needs to change. And so uh, a lot of folks are coming together, uh, administrators, teachers, parents, community leaders, faith leaders, uh, and others, and, and of course law enforcement, judges and others, uh, and we really have to sit down together and say, you know, these are our most precious resources, uh, our children, and we do not want to be throwing their lives away uh, you know, elementary school and middle school, uh, and there are things about this that we can change. And there are also, uh, you know, sort of discrepancies based on, you know, children who have special needs and, and on long racial and socioeconomic lines. And so really digging in and saying, how do we begin to solve some of these problems and again, make sure that these, kid, these kids can rise? Um, that they get derailed early uh, in their lives. And so it really is a passion for me. And, and I've seen across the spectrum so many people who want to come to the table uh, and solve this, this, this really important problem. You know, the time you were born, if you look strictly at yeah. what people say, you might have been at the end of Gen X. But, uh, <laughs> they got false over in the middle. But, it was but, 1979. But, was but, but, but here, some, yeah. some have said, and I wonder how you see yourself as more of a millennial <laughs> as far as the the perspectives yeah. and the attitudes that millennials bring to to life and to yeah. service. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think I do fall within that right, very right. Uh, sort of narrow uh, gap between, I think, Gen X and the millennials. And, and I think both bring so much to the table. I have been called an honorary millennial uh, oh. by some millennials. I'm a little too old to be you know, classified. Yeah, right, but, right. Uh, and I took that word as a badge of honor. Yes, but, right. uh, but what I think is that and I, and I have said this, and I actually was talking to some student groups who came to visit us from some great universities around the Commonwealth of Virginia recently. Um, I think the millennial generation is actually the kindest, most empathetic generation that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, I know each generation mm -hmm. has a moniker. We're the greatest mm -hmm. generation, which my grandparents were members of, mm -hmm. and, and that moniker fit very well, the sacrifices right. that they made uh, to make this country what it is today. Uh, but I, it's also the most connected generation when you look at millennials. And so I think that combina combination of compassion, empathy, um, and connection. They can reach somebody halfway around the world who they've never met with the click of a button. And I think it's the first time in human history that on a mass scale people have had that capability. And so it of course can be used for the wrong reasons, but when it's used for the right reasons, it's powerful. 
Uh, you talk about these movements that have transpired uh, over time. So I think if, if, if we bring the best of what that generation has to bear, it can help solve a lot of the challenges that historically uh, have kept us divided and have taken us down a road of cynicism and uh, fighting one another rather than helping each other rise. And so uh, and Gen X again, which I think I may more, more, more squarely fit uh, into um, as an innovative generation, uh, it's sort of a go-getter generation, and, and each generation has its own set of challenges. Uh, and, and there are a newer set of economic challenges. We've seen macroeconomic forces change the landscape, and you know, uh, we used to be able to you know, get a lot further right. on a lot less, yes. and, uh, and that's you know, not the case any longer. And so uh, those are some of the things I'm really looking forward to, to digging into that I've experienced myself. Uh, my wife, as you may know, is a dentist. We own a family dental practice uh, right. in Fairfax. She went to the VCU School of Dentistry right here uh, in Richmond, and, and we have two young kids. And so we're feeling the effects of some of those same things, and I think that helps make us more in tune with the challenges that people are facing and, and hopefully uh, even better able to help solve those challenges. Well, if someone looks on the Columbia University Law School and gets information about you there, yes. they will clearly, I think, call you a millennial because you, <laughs> you talk about faith, hope, and optimism. Yes. <laughs> and yes, I think yes. those are, uh, say something more about those those words because they're sure. not just words. I know they represent something to you. No, they do. And, and thank you for, for noting that. And in fact, what I would often say, and, and you know, I've told my story already, uh, is that to make that story possible, it really is mm. improbable in a lot of ways for all four of us, you being me and my three siblings, to have right. been able to do what we've done from where we uh, started uh, in life. People gave us something that I like to call spiritual wealth. Uh, that's sort of how I caption it. it. We didn't have a lot of money, but we had those things. We had faith, hope, optimism. We got a high quality education. Uh, we had people who loved us and said, no matter how dark today may seem, uh, tomorrow can be brighter. And you simply have to believe that every single day uh, of your life. And, and what I have said, and this is part of why I'm so passionate about public service, uh, is that when people give you that kind of spiritual wealth in your life, you then have a spiritual debt that you must repay. Uh, you can't simply you know, go somewhere and, and make the most money that you can and, and, and forget about the rest of the world. You gotta go out and fight and make that story possible for someone else because that's what people did for you. Um, and I say that spiritual wealth is not earned. Uh, people give it to you. Uh, when I was five years old and you know, the bottom sort of fell out for us, you know, it was by the grace of others and, and their right. deciding to invest in us and to give us that spiritual wealth that we were able to go uh, along the path that we did. And so what I believe is that we gotta go out and make that story possible for other people. Uh, uh, that expression is, is really powerful, S spiritual wealth, spiritual death. Yeah, thank uh, you. That's, that's the basic great. equation of my life. And, and frankly, I think of really all of our lives um, when you think about the fact that none of us got to where we are on our own. Uh, there were people who looked out for us, uh, oftentimes when we couldn't look out for ourselves. Um, and that's really what that spiritual wealth is all about. And people give it to people all the time. Teachers give it to students. Uh, you know, public servants give it when they uh, make you know, things possible for people around health care and education. And other things, grandparents give it to grandchildren. Uh, you know, strangers give it to, to yes. others in times of crisis. You know, we had this uh, terrible event with the Republican congressman who were on the Amtrak train the other day, and, and people have rushed to their aid. And fortunately, uh, you know, not too many of them uh, were hurt, and unfortunately, we lost the truck driver. But you see, in times of crisis, Americans come together. We rally around each other. We don't leave people. Uh, on their own and that all to me is what spiritual wealth is all about and when people get you in a good position uh, by doing those things for you and you get in a decent enough position to help somebody else that's what you do um, and that's how you repay that spiritual debt. You're not that long out of law school, not that long out of college. In fact, <laughs> high school's not that far away. So if, if you're, that's right. If, if in the last couple of minutes you were talking more sure. to, the, to the youth of yeah. Virginia to the young people, maybe yeah. the middle schoolers, yes, <laughs> a little, little older than than yours, yes. <laughs> or the high schoolers. What what words would you have of encouragement for them or advice to them? Sure. You're old enough to give them advice. <laughs> I feel that way most <laughs> right. most days, but yes. uh, you know, it, it's interesting. I actually had the uh, honor and, and privilege in uh, 2012 that she delivered the commencement speech for my alma mater, my high school. Uh, oh, Dematho, which is that's in Hyattsville, great. Maryland, and, 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 and in that speech, it was actually the National uh, Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception <clears throat> is where the graduation took place, and that's actually where I had graduated 16 years earlier. Um, and in that very speech, I talked about the concept of spiritual wealth. Uh, and so this has been a, a running theme uh, throughout you know, my life, and, and I would really give uh, the young people that same advice, which is, first of all, be kind to one another, be compassionate. Uh, there's no place for bullying uh, in our society. Uh, but also, uh, you know, want the best for yourself, but want equally the best for everyone else around you. Uh, and help everybody rise together. Uh, it will enrich your own life. 
Uh, it will enrich the lives of those around you uh, in your community. It will make us better. Uh, you will feel good uh, about the path mm. that you have chosen to take. Right. Uh, and don't become cynical. Always stay inspired, and uh, you will live a great life. And the two youngsters that you have, that must be an encouragement to you to keep <laughs> on keeping on. Yes, no, they are. And it's our, our eight-year-old uh, son, Cameron, and our six-year-old daughter, Karis. We love them very dearly, and uh, they really are the lights uh, of our life. And they do it's, uh, remind us every single day of what we can do uh, to make life better, not just for them, but for every young person in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Lieutenant Governor Fairfax, thank you so much for being on this. David, it's an Richmond. honor. Thank you thank for having you. me. It's thank an honor you. to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by The Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Health Care Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Uh -huh.